Thank you so much uh, for attending tonight. My name is William Teer, and I serve as the Assistant Director of Student Leadership Programs and the Center for Community Engagement. So welcome to Continuing the Legacy of Freedom Center, a panel discussion as part of the Center for Community Engagement's 2024 Voting Summit. Honoring the 60th anniversary of Mississippi Freedom Summer, the 2024 Voting Summit seeks to educate, inspire, and inform the LOU community of Freedom Summer and important lessons learned today. Tonight's event would not be possible without our amazing group of sponsors and colleagues. Thank you to the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement, the Center for Community Engagement, the Center for the Study of Southern Culture, one of our co-sponsors and hosts for tonight, the UN Voting Engagement Ambassadors, the UN Voting Engagement Roundtable, and Oxford to the Ballot Box. We are so thankful to have you all here tonight and welcome your presence at our additional Voting Summit events this week. Tonight, we take an introspective look to the past to better understand our presence and how we can all learn about the important work and sacrifices made during Freedom Summer. Our panelists tonight include veterans from Freedom Summer, along with modern activists continuing the legacy and work today. Tonight's panelists include Ms. Latoya Brown. Hey. Okay. Yeah, she is. Latoya has a long history of commitment to the Freedom Project Network. Originally from the Mississippi Delta, Latoya attended the Sunflower uh, County Freedom Project as a middle school and high school student. After graduating, Latoya studied sociology, specializing in criminal justice reform equitable education and black studies in which she earned a BA from the University of Southern Mississippi. Before becoming the executive director of the Freedom Project Network, she served as a teacher at Abramson Science Academy in New Orleans, where she taught global justice and designed a social studies curriculum partnered with the 1619 Project. Additionally, uh, Latoya is a spoken word artist, loves Beyonce, and spends her weekends listening to live bands. All right, Latoya. <laughs> Next, we have MacArthur Mac Cotton. Thank you, Mr. Cotton. <laughs> Mac Cotton has said the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement has always been a part of his existence. His grandfather was murdered for teaching local people to read. While walking into a church service at the age of 15, Mac witnessed a white boss shooting a black sharecropper six times because the sharecropper decided to go to church instead of plowing that day. His body lay there in the field for hours because people were afraid to carry him away. Decades later, Mr. Cotton was still angered by what seemed like people's indifference that day. Nobody really said or did anything, he said. Things like that just happened all the time. Matt Cotton began working with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, while a student at Tougaloo College, joining full-time SNCC activists and fellow Tougaloo students like Dory and Joyce Ladner, Jenny Travis, and Joan Trancourt. Together, they established a nonviolent action group on campus. Mr. Cotton was a freedom rider, too, and was arrested and put on death row for 39 days for trying to buy a bus ticket on the white side of the bus station. In Jackson, Mississippi, he was also arrested for distributing civil rights leaflets without a permit. After joining SNCC's work in Greenwood, Cotton led 200 people to the county courthouse to register to vote, which got him arrested. Cotton and other SNCC organizers were sent to the notoriously brutal Mississippi State Penitentiary, best known as Parchman Prison, because of their work helping Greenwood's residents to register to vote. At Parchman, Cotton and his colleagues were forced to lie on cold steel beds. Cotton was even hung by his hands for three hours in his cell. Despite this physical abuse, Cotton remained steadfast. After the movement, MacArthur Cotton worked on the Algebra Project in the Mississippi Delta, advocating for quality public education for all students. He continues his human rights work as a board member of the Veterans of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement, Incorporated. Next, we have Ms. Margaret uh, Kidney. Margaret Kitty, a white college student from San Francisco, California, wanted to go to Mississippi and join SNCC after hearing Fannie Lou Hamer talk about her experience with the voting rights movement. Ms. Kitty could not afford the trip, so she saved money from her babysitting gig and finally landed at the South in the summer of 1965. 
She was assigned to Indianola, Mississippi, the birthplace of the notorious White Citizens Council that enforced segregation in the state. Her primary focus was to transport people to the courthouse to register to vote while trying to replace the Freedom School that had burned down just a few months prior. While everyone else left the state at the end of the summer, Miss Kitty couldn't and settled in the Mississippi Delta. She eventually built a community center in Sunflower, Mississippi, which served as a central meeting place during the court ordered election in 1967. In 1970, she started working for the legal services in Greenwood, Mississippi as a paralegal, where she is still employed today. She currently serves as secretary for the veterans of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement Incorporated, board of directors, as well as for the Sunflower County Civil Rights Veterans Group. Ms. Kibbe says the movement defied, directed, and made my life. Next we have Mr. Karaja N. Mattery. <laughs> Karaja Mattery, a graduate of Jackson State University in political science and at the University of Alabama with a Master of Public Administration, is deeply committed to social justice. As the policy and research analyst at Mississippi Votes, he leverages his expertise to advocate for equitable policies. Engaged in organizations like the Mississippi Black Leadership Institute and Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, Karaji embodies a dedication to community empowerment and civic engagement. Last, we have Mr. Markel Kell Pittman. <laughs> Originally from Grenada, Mississippi, Kell is a graduate of Grenada High School, Holmes Community College, and Jackson State University. He is set to graduate from JSU with his MBA in political science this May and is laser focused on attending law school in the future. While at Jackson State University, Markell has served as Mr. Junior JSU and NAACP Youth and College President, in addition to the Fannie Lou Hamer Pre-Law Society President, Pre-Alumni Council President, and the Men of Excellence Vice President. Additionally, Mr. Pittman was a JSU Presidential and Dean Scholar political science Fannie Lou Hammer Award recipient, and Mississippi Votes Emerging Trailblazer Award recipient. Pittman has, a prou has proudly served as an intern for the Honorable Benny G. Thompson in Greenwood, Mississippi, and Jackson, Mississippi. He now serves as the Youth Civic Engagement Coordinator for Mississippi Votes Covering Central Mississippi. Mr. Pittman believes that God has given him the voice, connections, and knowledge to stand on behalf of the oppressed. His guiding scripture is Romans 8, 31, which says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Our panelists for tonight's event. And lastly, uh, we're so lucky and thankful to have Mr. W. Ralph Eubanks moderating tonight's discussion. W. Ralph Eubanks is a faculty fellow and writer in residence at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture right here at the University of Mississippi. He is the author of A Place Like Mississippi, A Journey Through a Real and Imagined Literary Landscape, as well as two other works of nonfiction. Thanks so much for our illustrious introductions, and I'll now turn things over uh, to Mr. Eubanks for the beginning of our conversation. Thank you all again. I want to thank you all for, for being here tonight. I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion. I'm just going to say before we get started, I see the way this discussion is uh, going to take place is we're going to be talking about three things here tonight. We're going to be talking about history, voting rights, and the legacy of Freedom Summer as it relates to education. I'll begin by asking questions of Mr. Cotton and Ms. Kibbe about their experiences in Freedom Summer. Uh, and then I'm going to move to kind of contemporary issues of, of voting rights with Ms. Mattery and Mr. Pittman. And then I'll move to Ms. Brown to talk about this linkage between the Sunflower County Freedom Project and the Freedom Schools that began in 1964. And then kind of have a little bit of a round robin discussion about, about all of this. So, I'm going to start with you, Mr. Cox, if you don't mind. <laughs> you, you mind, which okay. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, well, I mean, I'm starting with you because I mean, I, I um, just visited the B.B. King Museum, and one of the things that B.B. always said is, 
Well, you know, I've been around and I've seen some things. And you have been around and you have seen some things, um, including kind of some of the things that were mentioned in your introduction. Um, by the summer of 1964, you had already participated in some pivotal moments um, in the black freedom struggle, including your work with the Freedom Rides. How did what you witnessed while growing up and what you witnessed kind of in your participation with the Freedom Rides, how did that influence the shape of your activism, the things that you did as an activist? Well, I guess the first, I must say that uh, I don't think the Freedom Ride made me I think we made the free grass uh, much the same as we talked about the summer project. Uh, that uh, we call the summer project. I, I noticed the reading you called it Freedom Summer. Uh, and that that was our fourth, our, our third summer project. Yeah. So we had been building up to that. It wasn't something that came out of the era, you know, out of New York or something that sounded like the hell. It was something that we had worked on and strategized for three years. And the reason for the summer project, as we called it, was for protection for the people because they were murdering our people like nothing and, and nothing was being done about it. And we knew that if we could uh, integrate ourselves with some of the middle class uh, people out of across the country who had voting rights and citizenship rights, that we probably uh, we would be protected. If, and we were. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad that you made that clarification about, you know, Freedom Summer and the Mississippi Freedom Project, because the idea of Freedom Summer is really a media creation. Um, so I guess maybe kind of what do you see as this difference between what you experienced and kind of what the maybe the media package for the public to see? I don't know if I can quite answer that correctly or not, but uh, <clears throat> I guess one, just to uh, try to put some light on the subject, you know, this, the power of freedom struggles didn't start in the 60s. Well, I don't mm, know, it didn't. But it seemed that that's, that's the way uh, the media has made it look that uh, just somehow I know that I know where uh, the treatment first started. And, but I'm a product of a uh, grandfather who was enslaved and was able to uh, somehow know the car by the building of the place and a pretty good living for his family. And then my parents, both who were registered for them, so all of their lives. So I'm now voting age with her now my mother because she could have voted first, but when the thing was really good vote, she, she voted. And those things were a part of me. And it was just a matter of continuing that, not just myself, there were many of us who had already been given the charge to make sure that we did it all we could for the liberation of our people. And uh, I guess that's why a lot of people didn't understand uh, the Freedom Democratic Party when they offered us one seat, two seats. That wasn't about freedom, that was about something else. And then that's why we were refused, though we, we learned from that. A lot of those people who supposedly were our friends were not. They were working very hard against the movement, I guess total freedom, and just like it is today, there are those who are working right hard against the total freedom of African people in this country. So I mean, another thing I want to ask you, you started out in Walthall County out of, in working with um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and then you moved to Greenwood. I'm, I'm a native of South Mississippi, and my family has roots in the Delta. What was kind of the, what did you see as the difference in strategy between what you were trying to accomplish in Walthall County and what you were trying to do in Creekwood. I don't think it's hard to any. They go from places that are very suppressive. And very violent. Right, of course, very loud. Uh, 
course, the citizen council was in charge in the Delta because that's where the uh, police planners were and our that neighborhood sitting uh, matters peace to be able to do their work or get their work done. Whereas in, uh, you know, in Southwest Mississippi and some of the other EU countries, uh, the Ku Klux Klan took charge in the neighborhood. Then they have moved, then they have very much to protect. So they were quite violent. Yeah, so the power structure was different. The rights power. I think that's really the yeah, so um, now, Ms. Kibbe, you came to Mississippi from San Francisco. You ended up in Indianola, which is where the Citizens Council really began. Um, what was it that really inspired you to save up all that babysitting money well, and come to Mississippi? Yeah, I, was, uh, I, was, I knew I was going to do something. I knew I was going to commit to something. And I was following the Civil Rights Movement from the Bay Area, we'd we watch things on TV, talked about it in my house, used to like, and uh, got uh, because, because. <laughs> And so I, I knew I was going to do service, and I considered the Peace Corps, and I said, wait a minute, I had to clean up my own backyard before I could go in and cross the world. So I started uh, planning and wanting to go to the, to, to, uh, Mississippi. I wanted to go with 64, but I just didn't have the money. But um, I did have it in the, in the spring of 65. And so my mother had given me for my birthday three lives from Mississippi, hoping I'd change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but my feeling was there are people there. If they can be there and do this, I can too. And so um, I went. And then, as he said in my biography, uh, uh, there was still everything to do, and it hadn't been finished. And I was working with a really good project director, very unselfish, hardworking, uh, not working for himself, really working, trying to accomplish the goals of the movement, which our emphasis was voter registration. And uh, that's, uh, that's a great deal of what we did. And of course, we did get people to go to, I think there was a a uh, challenge, a congressional challenge, and we got people to go to that. I, I remember rounding up people for that, getting people to the bus to go to that. So we did we did different things, and then, as she said, we were trying to replace our freedom school. But I had a, a really good, um, good uh, project director, and then it was funny to me that I'd heard Mrs. Hamer at my junior college. And now it was in her county. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was co coincidence. Nothing was playing. Now, you, you mentioned the Freedom Schools and the Freedom School at, at Bird. Right. Um, and activist Septua Clark, who I, I think of as kind of the mother of the Freedom School movement, um, spoke of her activism as broadening the scope of democracy to include everyone and deepening the concept to include every relationship. What did you see as the connection between your activism and this idea of broadening the scope of democracy? Uh, well, I could bring democracy to <laughs> Well, then, you, yes, you were. <laughs> we didn't know. That's true. We didn't really have. No, we didn't. In fact, I, um, I always have to admire people like MacArthur and some of the other people that have started before I did. The people who got started in the early 60s, it was incredibly dangerous. It was dangerous anyway. You had, but nothing like it was pre-64, uh, because you had people who wanted to kill you, and would if they had the chance. I mean, we, the, the previous year, we had a demonstration to uh, integrate the library in Indianola, and people got beaten up and thrown in jail for trying to do that. So. Uh, people, I don't think people understood the violence that was employed to enforce the old system. And there was another thing that struck me but when I came. I felt like I was in a, a fascist state. I mean, I could skate from because I could go out drinking or something like that. But what I'm saying is that it was like they were always watching you. You were in, in control, or, you know, being controlled. And so we had these old phones where you crank and you tell the operator who you want to talk to and uh, if you said something negative about somebody that your phone would start ringing so 
it, it's like they were keeping up with you all the time and you're being surveyed. Yes, I mean, I mean, I mean I, your, your mention of the violence kind of leads me to a question that I, mean, I really want to ask both of you to, to respond to because you both witnessed a great deal of violence as well as a great deal of racial hatred. My question is, has there been too much emphasis on atonement and the way we remember the evils that happened during the civil rights era? And can there be real atonement if no one actually acknowledges where I'm dealing? Uh, I'm not, maybe he can answer. My own feeling is now, because it was so long ago, everybody is, well, I wasn't like that. And I, I didn't I think that. maybe it's, a, yeah, it's that distancing from right. it that maybe is keeping us from maybe engaging with that, the, the level of atonement that needs to happen. Do you think that that's maybe what it is? So it's a question I often ask, yeah. have, have my students begin to think about, we discuss the movement and we begin to think about the movement and how it exists in American memory today. Mm -hmm. And that issue of atonement really is one that I really try to, that I wrestle with. Well, you think? Well, man, the first part of atonement, from my understanding, is admitting that you are wrong, mm -hmm. that admitting your guilt. And then you can begin in tone. Right. I mean, I think I, I agree with you. And I, I just remember the day the Civil Rights um, Museum opened, um, Governor Phil Bryant said, today, let every, you know, all uh, grievances be passed. And, and I'm sitting there saying, <laughs> no, they can't be, because we haven't really, we haven't really kind of gotten into them. So. Yeah. I mean, if you can vote for true, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, you know, if, if you are, uh, you know, if you are still endorsing or accepting racism, uh, it, it, you know, we're not ready for it. <laughs> they okay. didn't to tone it. Right. Well, I want to move on to, uh, do you have something that you want to say there? I was going to say that it's very clear, you know, in the last few years, we have been uh, going back on problems probably yeah. all the progress, so-called progress we have made in education and on the registration and, and practically everything. So obviously we are not interested in tone, we're interested in re, uh, reverting back to what, what we've been doing. Thank you. I want to move on to kind of voting rights with uh, Mr. Mattery and Mr. And Manu, you know, whichever one wants to kind of take this this question. I mean, what do you see, but both of you see as the connection between your work at Mississippi Votes um, and voter registration efforts during Freedom Summer? How do you see, I guess, really, what's the bright line that connects those two things? What do you, you see in your work that connects those two things? Um, I think I can start off. And just a correction, my last, my, the last name is Mature. 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 Not, it's, it's not good. But uh, the connection, um, when you look at 1964 and just that Freedom Summer, you know, that's the roots of a lot of social justice movements uh, going on today, including ours, Mississippi Votes. Um, you, you look at that history of, of really getting out the vote as it relates to voter registration, uh, education, and mobilization, getting people out there to vote. You know, that's the that that's what organizations like ours, Mississippi Votes. That's what we you know kind of look at. Uh, you know, if, because during that time that worked. So, uh, and just how he was saying, you know, we're still seeing uh, the stuff that was happening then happen now. You know, we're having to go back and, and re reinventing the wheel and looking at that original blueprint, which is Freedom Summer, to to educate people and register people out the vote and get back to that grassroots effort of today uh, as it was in the past. Now, my next question is thinking about, you know. Mr. Cotton and, and Ms. Kibbe, who both were doing voting registration before the Voting Rights Act was actually enacted. And um, you, Mr. Tory, and Mr. Pittman are doing work after voting rights activism after the Shelby v. Holder decision that really struck down the pieces of the Voting Rights Act. How do you see the Shelby v. Holder decision shaping the work of Mississippi Post? Uh, 
Mr. Yeah, so I would like to say that it just makes us want to go even harder in our line of work. Um, and when I say that, I, I'm saying that when we go to these different campuses, with me being the Youth Civic Engagement Coordinator, I deal with a lot of high school students and a lot of college students. And those problems that Mr. Matori was talking about, um, they're very relevant to this day. Um, and how legislation is changing on the daily and how it's confusing our students. Uh, we have to be persistent in our line of work. Um, even when a lot of people have given us no's when we try to go into voter registration um, simply because they think we might be a part of this party or that party. But it makes us want to just go even harder in our line of work and really strive to actually do what we do. Right now, the part of the Voting Rights Act that was struck down in the Show Me Beholder decision was Section 5. That was the pre clearance requirement for states that has, had historically suppressed uh, black voting rights. And the Supreme Court said that Section 5 was, was section no. Four. Section 4. Section 4. covered by Section 5. Ah, thank you. Um, but it was no longer needed because the Chief Justice of the United States wrote. African American voter turnout has come to exceed white voter turnout in five of the six states covered by the Voting Rights Act. And that year, the, the Shelby Beholder decision came about, was the last year that that had happened. Uh, according to the Brennan Center for Justice, between 2012 and 2020, the white black voting gap grew from 9.2% to 20.9%. So across five of the six states covered by the Voting Rights Act. What are you doing at Mississippi Votes to try to close that gap that's, that has come about as a result of the Shelby v. Voter decision? Um, well, uh, one thing with me, when we're trying to understand um, legislation like Shelby v. Holder, um, you know, it's just history repeating itself. Uh, when you look at uh, Jim Crow and just that whole era of you know, black people not being able to vote. Uh, it's the same thing going on now. So with what, what we're doing, you know, we, we research, we see what the issues are. We talk to the, talk to people in, in the community, uh, real grassroots efforts to see uh, what are the issues that, that's going on in our communities. Uh, and when you look at that, you try to you try to advocate, you try to get as educated as many as many people, especially young people, to understand what's going on. When when you look at so much uh, misinformation and disinformation that, that's, that's as it relates to social media, and you, you look at the, the large voting block of young people that, that you know, are, that relate to social media, uh, you have to try to advocate, and you, you have to try to figure out ways to combat, you know, the legislation that young people aren't paying, paying attention to that's gonna affect them over time. Yes. And also to say what he's saying, also trying to educate them and getting them to understand the language of these different fields and legislation. Because the legislation sometimes can go over our head because it's worded differently or in a wording that we can't understand. And so that's something that we try to break down to our young people as well. And, and I'll pick back on what he was saying. You, you look at this uh, legislative session uh, in Mississippi right now and you see a lot of legislation that um, you know, legislators are passing without you know, probably uh, checking with their actual uh, constituents or just young people in general, because all these policies that they're trying to enact, trying to pass by, especially since uh, Shelby v. Holder, since states have more, have more, have more uh, say-so in, in the, the vote voting <coughs> policies that they want to pass, you know, they're able to uh, have legislation that, that can negative impact, especially younger people, especially ones that, that go to colleges like Ole Miss uh, and the different colleges that we have. You know, they uh, just had a legis try to pass legislation uh, just to see where 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 it would get when you're looking at the um, uh, the the potential of shutting down three um, Mississippi uni uh, colleges and universities. Uh, you know that 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 can affect Mississippi as a whole. Uh, not you know, of course, you look at HBCUs. You're looking at regional universities like the W uh, and Delta State, you know, and they're they're trying to to pass this legislation without uh, young people having a voice in, and even knowing knowing what's going on uh, around them. Yeah. Well, thank you. Now, I, I mentioned um, you know, Governor Bryant's 
um, note at the Civil Rights Museum when you're saying, today little grievances be passed. And I think that kind of represents the way much of Mississippi's political establishment would say that there's no real need for voting rights advocacy uh, in the post-civil rights era. So if those people were in this room right now, um, because now you're kind of preaching to the choir here, but if those people were in this room, what would you say to them? And what would you say, why would we need, still need organizations like Mississippi Folks in the 21st century? Um, for one, I would say because we make sure that we have equality for everyone. And um, if they were in this room, I would say step in the shoes of the other people that had to walk the other walk um, to see, you know, how they had to persevere to get where we are right now. So um, what we do is that we do election protection. Um, we make sure that um, whether it's felons, if they want their rights to vote, we make sure that they have their rights to vote because a vote is for everyone, not just for someone that hasn't gotten in trouble or just have this perfect way of life, but it's for everyone. And we want to ensure that everyone is educated about voting, that everyone understands the legislation, and that's why we are a relevant organization in Mississippi, and that's why we are continuing to thrive. So, Mr. Okay. Tort? Um, I wouldn't necessarily, if we say, if you said if they were coming in, yeah, home, yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say anything to them. I'd probably just hop in the car and and go to you know, one of our targeted areas where you know voter suppression as well, and just show them like, you know, this is what happened because which what we're getting is uh, state uh, policy leaders. They're they're saying one thing, but when you go into the community and, and you see a whole another thing happening. Uh, when you look at, you know, when, when they talk about uh, uh, voter ID, uh, they, you know, they say they say one thing, but you go out in the community, it's a it's a suppressing issue. Uh, when you talk about uh, ballot harvesting, what, as it relates to uh, helping, you know, people with disabilities or people who have an issue trying to get out to vote uh, for whatever for, for for whatever reason, uh, they say this, but it's a whole nother reason when you go go out into the community. So I'll just take them to the actual communities where they're like there, where people are being suppressed, where we have real life communities in Mississippi that are marginalized and places and, where there aren't enough ballots. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, that just happened. Thank you. So I'm going to move to you, Ms. Brown. So I'm long been a fan of the. Sunflower County Freedom Project. I think particularly the way that uh, it keeps the history and the spirit of the movement alive and the students who choose to be a part of it. Could you tell the audience about the scope of the work of the Freedom Project and how you see its connection to the legacy of freedom set up? Okay. Um, well, first, I think that, you know, Mr. Potter brought up something that was true where it's like the movement didn't start in Freedom Song, although the media really took to Freedom Song. I think the movement actually started in the 1800s where we had um, laws mandating free and enslaved black people, preventing them from like reading and writing. But what happened as a form of resistance to free and enslaved black people is that we're gonna form literary societies. And we're gonna keep this in secret, but we're still gonna make sure that we are learning how to read and write, and we, we're still gonna make sure that we are teaching each other um, through love, education, and Societies, my, my study of literary societies and understand that was the leak. I was like, oh, this, this is something that has always been a part of us. We, um, in, in our freedom struggle, we're going to continually figure out ways to make sure that we are still having our um, rights and we're still treated as full citizens. But the thing, I, the thing I really want to say is like, despite the many challenges that have been faced in the freedom struggle, one thing that has remained true is Black Mississippians across space and time joining together to come back to unfair um, social conditions that were experienced um, in our communities. 
And so how does that connect to Freedom Summer? Well, when Brown versus, but we had the Supreme Court, um, and we know that for a while it was before, um, the, sorry, before the Supreme Court mandated Brown versus Board of Education and saying that, you know, separate is unequal. Um, before that time, we still had um, unequal education. And so what happened was we had Freedom Summer as or Freedom Schools as a way to say, once again, we are not getting the rights that we deserve, but we are still going to form our own societies, our own freedom schools, these independent schools where we decide what our students learn um, and what we should act and organize around. So how does it connect today and the Freedom Project Network? Um, so we have Sunflower Freedom School, but we also have Rosedale and Meridian. Um, and the work that we are doing with our students is, so our mission is that we work alongside our young people to, um, sorry, we work alongside our young people with for community and justice um, and teaching them about community and justice through liberatory education. So what we're saying is we value your experiences, we value your history, and we wanna like, and we want to connect those two things in order to figure out how can we organize in our communities to once again gain equal education. And so our program, we have arts programs, we have filmmaking, uh, we have uh, visual arts, we have screen printing, we have just different ways, different mediums for our students to express who they are and tell their stories and tell the community, start their community stories through their art. But we also have this newer initiative, the Restorative, ju sorry, the restorative Facilitator, uh, fellowship and it's basically a, a fellowship where our students have been trained in restorative justice practices and they have been also trained in other educators in restorative justice practices and other youth serving organizations to once again say hey we want to be treated as people while we're in the schools um, and so I think that is the way we have tied so Freedom Summer has been about organizing. The literary societies have been about organizing to fighting for equal education. And we are doing the same work now where we are saying, where we are saying that the improvements are not there. The, the public schools that our students are go to, they, they are still facing the same issue of being under resourced. Um, lack of teachers in the classroom. Also because Mississippi doesn't don't pay teachers well and definitely understand it, but the consequences of that for our students um, and, and their need to like fight back and, and again, organize, keep using this word organized, and that's really what it's about. It's about our youth coming together to say, hey, this is our issues of today. And as adults, I think we need to be the allies in helping them to figure out the best strategies to organize in their communities to make sure they get equal education. I, mean, I, think, I think that's really, Great and admirable, and, and I think one of the things when I think about the freedom schools um, that were that came up in the summer of 1964, um, I think it, for a lot of Black Mississippians, that was the first time they were really encouraged to act politically, but also to act on their creative impulses. And um, and I think you kind of outline what those are as the components of. The freedom, you know, the freedom school, freedom project network. Yes. Now, one of the hopes of the Black freedom struggle was that the movement would lead to educational equity, um, particularly in places like the Mississippi Delta. And as you noted, there are lots of gaps in that right now. I think there are over a thousand teacher vacancies in the Mississippi Delta alone, uh, more than anywhere else. In Mississippi, how do you see the role of the Freedom Project as helping to bring some measure of educational equity for those who choose to take part in the project? I go back to the young people and the young people deciding what education should even look like for them in, in our contemporary society. I think that 
in terms of like equal education, as far as like what the Freedom Project role, I think our role is once again to upskill our youth to be able to advocate for themselves and also provide resources to them where they can matriculate out of high school and into college um, and then return it back into their communities if they choose to in order to upskill the next youth. So for example, we have an alumni college success program where our alumni who graduate from our one of our sites, they go to college and they are into this program where we are providing still ongoing support while they're in college all the way up into graduation. Um, but I think that like each, how to answer, how, how do we solve the issue of unequal ed education? Like it, it is so compounded because it's not just the education itself, it's also like the way that the criminal justice system um, rolls into that. So it's like one, students, in classrooms are don't have don't always have teachers, don't always have textbooks. Um, most of the times they are learning from the computer. That's one thing. Um, they're not always taught about themselves in their curriculum. So you know, like Black history isn't, or any history of folks of color really is not is not taught in the classroom in the curriculum. And then there's this other beast of criminalizing these Black and Brown youth while they're in school. So that it, so there's two fights. It's one of like, we need to be educated well, and we also need to not be treated like criminals. So uh, it's some facts that I'm sure that we all know is that we know that black and brown students are disproportionately suspended and expelled from schools. How they show up in our schools in the Delta? Well, a kid can be suspended for not having a shirt tucked in properly, or not um, oh, sorry, or for disrespecting a teacher in a way that, you know, like disrespect is also subjective. <laughs> um, but, if, <laughs> but yes, but if a teacher say a student is disrespected then a student can get suspended for that. It also shows up where students with disabilities are not being provided their accommodations and or there are no intervention plans in place at all um, in order to provide the resources for, for those students. Like it's, how to solve an equal educational school is is to me is is such a beast because there's like so many things that goes into it like you're trying to tackle every part that exists in order to provide equal education to, to you so what you're saying educational equity is is a nice little pat catchphrase but that has lots of tendrils yes. out in it that you have to Kind of bring yes. in to even achieve that. Yes. I mean, I, this is a question for you first, but I'd like to kind of put this to all of you. I mean, is this idea of educational equity is that the biggest missing piece of the civil rights struggle? That we're uh, we've worked on it, and I, I, I can say this because I'm familiar with my. Did you your microphone for me? The San Bernard County uh, Freedoms Project. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had dealings with them and been to been to their site before um, and I know some of the families that the children from uh, Sunflower I know those families those kids were not going to go to college but they went to the that project and they did go to college and I think a lot of it is reading a lot of reading and then another thing they were allowed to do is be creative like do things themselves write things themselves put on plays and so they were educating themselves or being educated and they were they were allowed to be creative which in regular public school a lot of times you don't do that you know you don't do your own independent writing you don't create things yourself so you recite something that somebody gave you to recite and so I think the uh, I personally know that the Sunflower County Freedom um, School project was an outstanding project and really fulfilled a good role in South Flower County. And I'll say one thing about education. Um, it is true that we have a lot of lacks. Also, I think it's true. Mississippi has more prisoners per capita of any other state. And they, I have heard, I'm not an expert on this, but I believe it's true, that they can plan prisons based on third grade reading scores. Ooh, wow. Um, yes, and if you look at, um, I think it's Raj Chetty's um, Opportunity Atlas, you can begin to see how some of that really shapes out census tract versus census tract around the country. 
And but you see that especially in, in the Delta because I think it's Sunflower County, the uh, incarceration rate is close to 5% of the population. And I, uh, well, I even know what that legal services in well, 2010, I think, two, somewhere around it here. But I've been in law, I work in a law office now, uh, as a sort of an independent contractor. But uh, anyway, I, I've been in law, but legal stuff, ever since I've been in Mississippi. <laughs> and so I, I can, you know, it's nothing new to watch disparities. You know, you, you work in a law firm and you know somebody's got a few bucks and they get out of stuff. And somebody, I had a client who went to prison for conspiracy. And I know he did not have the ability to conspire to do <coughs> anything. Mm -hmm. A lawyer could have gotten him out. They don't. Well, I mean, these next couple of questions are for, are for everyone. Um, now, thinking about you know, Freedom Summer, you know, working toward racial justice um, is not just the moral thing to do, but it's also crucial to our democracy. Um, I think that was the point of Freedom Summer, you know, trying to get the country to see that uh, racial justice was well, kind of a piece of a democracy. What do you all see as the essential parts of the continuing of continuing the work of Freedom Summer in the 21st century, particularly when the language of the civil rights era is used by those who are dismantling? the work of the Black Freedom Charter. Call them out, call them out every time. <laughs> I mean, and we do have that quite a bit where the, that language, particularly the idea of colorblindness is used as a way to thinking that we don't really need to kind of work for racial justice. What is it that, you know, what's, what should we be doing to keep that work from continuing to be dismantled? Think of you were talking about uh, the lack of uh, education of my blacks for the last, uh, I guess, 20 or so years. It occurred to me that we have a very serious problem of not educating the whites. Uh, well, the only thing we learned about uh, 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 quite important white people are uh, uh, generals and, you know, how they were, you know, maybe a free presidents or something. Who knows anything about the labor movement? You know, who knows anything about just other regular health struggles? Uh, important uh, white people who worked hard to make sure that the health was available to the people. They don't know nothing about that. They don't teach that either. So if, if we were taught better about real things and not about a bunch of dealing with who slaughtered a lot of people, we are proud to be a better people. <laughs> Come on. Yes. I would say we need to strategize. Um, I think that as much as you know, people who are working against us are strategizing, we need to be doing the same. And we need to be rebuilding grassroots grassroots movements that we also saw in the 60s um, in order to combat these issues. Um, I think that we need so one of the reasons why we, you know, are a network instead of individual sites is because we what we decided we need to pull our resources together and also listen for the similarities of the experiences that are happening across communities. So the issues that our students face in school in Rosedale or Sunflower is very much similar to the issues that our students are facing in Meridian. But how can we get our young people together and how can we um, use the adult allies for, for our young people in order to strategize and again fight um, against all of these you know, you call it the, the people who are dismantling um, the progress, but I think the dismantling is gonna always happen. Like, it's gonna always, like, I feel like it's gonna be something that there are gonna be people who are always working against us. So I feel like we have to continually figure out and evolve how can we continue the progress um, that we've made thus far. Yeah, I mean, we've, had, we've had 60 years of a backlash. Um, anyone else comment about that? What? Oh, what? Um, well, about kind of the you know what we what should we be doing to keep from the 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 gains of freedom struggle from being dismantled. I would also say being organized. She says strategize, and I would say organization as well. Like now, I, I, seeing the young people now, we're we're not organized. 
and that that's part of the reason we have different strategies but we don't have organization and that's part of the key of us missing out on what we need because we can all have strategy but we have to move together in that strategy so i believe that organization also was a key factor in that yeah i mean i think that really kind of goes back to where we began talking about the freedom project was the organization that was part of the, that organization was going on for for years um, to, to get that started. There was another thing that I wanted to point out that I thought was important about the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. MacArthur probably remembers this, but I know in Indianola, we had, a, it went back to organization and organizing. And we had, we had block groups that would meet every week and go over issues and talk about voter registration and eat a piece of cake. <laughs> but you know they kept people together and even when the movement sort of was dying down there were one or two chairpersons that kept those things going these were local people who kept these things going and had these things going on in their houses and you have to keep in mind one of the meetings that i would attend pretty regularly was two houses down from a house that had been burned you know blown up bombed for housing civil rights workers so the um the the um there was that organization then you had the blocks then you had the town then you had the county and you had the district but it was a, a complicated organization but it was an organization that was done with really no money i mean it was just people who did things well i have one final question i want to open it up to the audience for four questions um the historian Michael Kamen um, said, what people believe to be true about their past is usually more important in determining their behavior and responses than truth itself. Contemporary representations of the movement can have a powerful influence on how people understand not only the past, but the present as well. Remembering the movement then, I would say, is an ongoing, and I would even say also frequently contested political project, as well as a historical one. So how do each of you see your work um, to keep both the political and the historical project of the civil rights movement alive? So it's even those two things. There's, there's the political and there's the historical. And I think we were trying to, over time, maybe dilute some of that, the historical truths. What do you see as kind of how you're keeping the political and historical project of the civil rights within the lodge? Education. But yeah. <laughs> it's it's I, I would be uh, trying to uh, follow you, but you know, we, we have, as you said, a bit of a reality, and there seems to be uh, progress, which it is some progress. Also, we have other realities, retrogress, you know, and very serious at this point. But I, I thought about uh, something uh, about how we have been treated as uh, citizens, uh, supposed to be citizens, since we're supposed to be citizens, uh, for our rights to be protected, uh, we get a, a writ, we get another bill, another this, another that, and then it has a sunset to it. So, okay, you have your voting rights for 10 years, you're going to have to come back in 10 years and get a renewal and get all of that. It, it just seems to me that uh, we, are, we, are being, we are being tricked by even accepting these so-called extra rights. Why can't we just have the same rights and that same right be protected? Why can't it just that simple? So, Mr. Tori, yes. Um, yeah, I'll just say, um, you know, you no, know, we have you have all these you know, organizations now, but you really have to ask, like, what, what what are these organizations doing 
uh, to be effective today. You know, you look at other organizations uh, in the 60s that had that impact uh, with the Freedom Summer. Um, when you look at the COFO, uh, the COFO model, you look at stuff like that, you try, you, and you look at today, you have to try to incorporate what worked uh, those historical blueprints and you know, trying to adapt them to you know, what's today. Uh, Mississippi Votes, you know, we, uh, we try to incorporate things you know, like you know, education. Uh, this summer we have a, a, youth, uh, a youth policy, um, a youth policy summit uh, for uh, high school students, uh, you know, which is you know, the roots come from you know, Freedom Summer. Uh, you know, so we, so what, what, what are events what projects or organizations such as ours, what, what are we doing to, to have some type of impact? Uh, you know, we have, you know, like I said, we, we have the pol Policy Summer Institute uh, for youth in high school. Um, we have programs uh, that are specific for, for, for college students to you know, have a, so that they can be, become more engaged and aware of what's going on uh, from their perspective and what changes they can have. Um, and that uh, with uh, me, uh, I'm working with a professor at Jackson State who's trying to implement the COFO model. Uh, in, in the model. Ma'am. What is that model? The, the COFO model. Uh, the COFO model, uh, just how in the 60s, where you had SLCL, Martin Luther King's organization, you had NAACP. You had all, all these SNCC, you had all these- it's Council, uh, Council of Federated Organizations. Yes, yeah, Council of Federated Organizations. You had all these organizations come together to uh, affect change in Mississippi, uh, the COFO model. So uh, with the professor I'm working with at Jackson State, you know, his, his thing is, is the COFO model. Today you have all these impactful organizations on the college campus. You have your Greek organizations, you have your SGA, you have uh, your NAACP, NAACP chapters on campus. You know, what, what can we do today and, and how, can, how can it look so where we can impact change and, and have our voices heard and help those who in our communities who don't have their voice heard, voices heard, how can we help them have their voices heard? Well, um, what did you say? I'm saying, oh, sorry. thank you. Yeah. Um, no, I was going to say, um, I think that we have to show love to one another. Um, Asana Shakur said, you know, mentioned that uh, we must love each other, we must support each other. It's the only way that we'll be able to lose our chains. I think we have to edu educate. I think everyone on the panel said something about education, and I will also say education because I think um, education gives us, gives us the power that we need. When we when we know what we know, we're able to act on it. And my third thing is action. Like we must take action. We must take action to transform our societies. Um, even when when the fear has seeped in, I think we need to push through that fear. And also, hope is a discipline. So my last one is discipline, and I think that we. We must keep our hope. We, we must like step, be steadfast in our hope in a way where like nothing can shake us from making the changes that, that we need to make. Thank you. Now I've got some questions here from the audience. Um, the first one is: You've all talked about how the movement began long before the 1960s and the Freedom Project. How can we raise these movements and activists to the forefront of state and national memory? Um, I mean, just, I mean, I, one of the things that I often teach in my class of rights and activism is voter registration in Florida in the 1920s. When people don't think that there's actually voter registration then, that pe black people were lobbying to vote, They're kind of knowing about those things, what do you see as the, um, how can we raise these past movements to uh, the forefront of national memory so that we are not always frozen in this only thinking about Freedom Summer, but what came before it and what actually led up to it? Well, I think uh, like uh, a lot of it is, you know, most of us, if we're gonna learn these things, we have to read up how um, it, It's amazing how, you know, a lot of people admitted that they were adults before they knew about the Tulsa massacre care. Um, and back Arthur brought up about the labor movement. All of us, we get weekends, we get benefits, we get all of that, you know, eight hour days. That was non-existent before the labor movement. You know, these things 
we don't understand. And the, the people who started out, uh, some of them got killed, but you know, was arrested for the very ungiving hands. And so we have all these movements that have essentially made us. And we need to understand this and what people went through or what people had to overcome to to get this. Now, I don't know if everybody's familiar with this, the humanities have some grants for markers, for freedom markers. And so if you have a freedom marker, somebody you want to commemorate, you can apply and you can get a free marker. Uh, no, it's not. We're, we're about to get one here for the Fools of Chapel protests. Okay, good. And we've got one uh, coming up. We've got two actually coming up in Indianola. And one is for Dr. Clinton Battle, and the other one is for our Freedom House that we used for our office after the school was burned. That's where I worked. Uh, but the, the uh, Dr. Battle was NAACP in the 50s, and he was run out of. Indianola, but he was, that had to be hardly courageous to be trying to register people to vote and organize an NAACP in some uh, in Indianola in the late 50s. It didn't happen. And one other thing that I think people need to understand too that fits in with this fascism thing, um, the, not long after Board v. Brown, um, the Mississippi started the set up the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission. All of us were spying. And you have you can go online right now and look up your your um, file folder. And there's a certain amount of preoccupation of who you were having sex with and stuff like well if you were. I mean it's a lot of it's it's crazy. Room room in, in <laughs> yeah, but it's it's interesting because somebody was following you. And, and it's interesting to see who they connected you to and who, what they saw you doing and you didn't realize you were being watched. And uh, I was, I had gone through a project where I was assimilating people's sovereignty commission files so they could keep up with it. But some of them were really funny, some of the entries. And she would ask me about Charles McLaurin. I oh yeah, I'm, I'm friends with McLaurin. He's in Sunflower County. And so I, started assembling his um, his sovereignty commission file and it was very busy and then all of a sudden it stopped and I was wondering what's going on here because there was something you know every few days there'd be an entry and then there was none and so I found out what happened Matt Lerner was kind of friends with the sheriff I mean, he was nice to all of us if there was nobody watching but uh, uh, he pretended like he didn't know you if his friends showed up but anyway uh, he went to the to the sheriff and he said, um, I need a permit for a gun. And the sheriff said, well, Charles, why do you need a gun? Oh, uh, you don't need a gun. He said, yeah, I need a gun. There's somebody following me. Uh, <laughs> and, so, and he said, don't, don't get your gun. I, I'll take care of it. Oh, uh, so that's... And that's, so he ran the sovereignty commission person off and that's when his file stopped. Well, I mean, I wanted to, another question from the audience here said, the panel briefly mentioned racial colorblindness. Do you think recognizing personhood first and generally pointing out race less might do more for healing and racial unity? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and why? Why not? <clears throat> like, if I see a person, I see a person in all of who they are. So to ignore race, like to act as if you can't see a person's race or our social construction of uh, understanding what race is, like is not real. And so to also like ignore a person's race is also ignore a person's culture. Uh, it's, also, it's also to ignore a person's history. And so, you know, you, you talked about atonement. Well, how can we atone for anything if we choose to ignore a person's full um, humanity and, and who they are? So I actually think it, it's counterproductive to be colorblind um, and say that, you know, racist disease, or we just wanna look at the human, especially when like the laws don't just look at us as human, they look at us as, as our race. Police don't look at us as human, they look at us as our race, and our gender, our class, all of these like social constructions. Like the reality is that's just not true for our state. And so we cannot 
also do that to each other. And sweeping it under the rug. I mean, we're going back to, you know, pretending like these things didn't happen. Yeah, so I, I grew up colorblind. There were many, many uh, very light-skinned people in my community, uh, in my school. That was colorblind, but then we talk about the oppressors versus those who are oppressed. Then we can't pretend like they are the same. Um, another question from the audience. Bernice Johnson Reagan and her daughter, I believe it's Toshi, both musical are both musical arts, they stress the role of music in taking up part in performance as a key organizing practice. Is this idea of kind of using music, uh, is this practice not, is this, is this or is this not practical today? Well, I don't know about today, but I think so. But I, because uh, I like to listen to the old freedom songs. I got Matt Jones CD, uh, but it's in one of his songs is, uh, when I was young, I fought the Klan. Who thought I'd be fighting 40 years down the road? You know, mm -hmm. so that says something to me. But the, um, I remember hearing something about singing and how important it was in the movement. And it was a way to sing fear away. You know, you, you, basically, you knew you were taking a chance by coming to the, the mass meeting, but you were there. And then when people start singing, you felt back. And there was always a little bit of singing in the beginning of a meeting. And they said, and nobody could do it better than Mrs. Hamer. <laughs> and so uh, it has its place. But, you know, I, I think you have to be judicious about it. But I think music fits. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to say I think music in a contemporary form also is relevant for the movement. I mean, you think about when the Black Lives Matter movement was, um, I think at, at the height of where we like had a lot of organizing people going into the streets. We did it. We used people like Kendrick Lamar. We used some Beyonce songs. We used these people, these figurative artists who we use as like a way to again talk about hope and like also just to talk keep about people, joy too. to talk about joy. Yes, and keep like people's spirits up during this time. Um, and I mean, you know, trap music is like has a like uh, people that down on trap music, but also feel like trap music is also relevant for the movement because if we're talking about the way people are talking about their personal experiences, although we may not agree, oh, although we may not agree, there's their narrative and their stories being told in a way that may make us look down upon them is still important for them to tell. It also is important for, is, I think it's, it's, it's important for the movement. It's almost, like, it's almost like, you know, kind of coded messages in the blues being yes. things of protest. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so. Also, um, just looking at, you know, today, uh, the music, you know, that's another thing a lot of organizations like ourselves have to implement. Like we have a art, arts and activism, um, fellowship going on. We got about, I want to say about eight or nine uh, people that's in the arts, um, pictures, um, you know, visual arts, uh, producers, uh, music, because there, there is, um, you know, there is music where, you know, uh, people, a genre of music where people are, have a, they're, they're addressing issues, political issues, they're, address, they're addressing social and economic issues. There is music out there that addresses uh, issues that are that are happening today. Um, and when you look in the past, you know it's always it's, it's the same thing. Um, I, I don't want to get her name wrong, but a music artist. Uh, I think and I, her special was on who Billy Jean was the artist in the past where her music was her music was so powerful. The, uh, they had the government coming out there. That's how powerful her music was as related to. Billy, Billy Holiday, my, my apologies, Billy Holiday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Billy Jean, Billy Jean. Okay. But I mean, Billy, yeah, Billy Holiday. But if you look at today, that the music can have that same effect, especially with, with organizations like us, when you implement that into you know what you and how in, in the narrative and the strategies that you want to have uh, to create some type of impact uh, amongst young people. Yeah, thank you. Follow up, Louis. Yes. Do I get a mic? Okay. I want you. You want to come up and huh? you want to come up and. Okay. Because we got we got we got, got Mike here and Roger. 
Yes. So, um, uh, Kira Gaunt, uh, uh, ethnomusicologist, uh, I asked that question. You should stop, go sir. Um, but Bernice Johnson Regan is the founder of the singing movement during that era. Um, and this, this wasn't mass produced music, it was music of the people singing together. So the question is about the kind of music that is not produced by a celebrity, that is sung by people that are a part of the movement, who come together like in this room and we could sing, we might be able to sing Amazing Grace together. In the context of a fight for justice. And so it has a very different role than singing something you learned from the radio or from your headphones. And so I'm wondering if that's practical today. Where you see If you see, especially for young people, who most of the music consumption is by, well, I don't know. There's a local component. I'm asking because I'm not from Mississippi. I'm like, is that happening? Or what does that look like today? And I would love to hear what it looked like yesterday and during the era of the Freedom Project in the 60s. Thank you. So, oh. Oh. Um, I would say at the Freedom Project Network, we still see the freedom songs as uh, community building and we call them, we do our circle ups and freedom songs is foundational to the, the, our circling up with each other, coming into the community with each other, um, also just talking about like our lead principles, love, education, action, and discipline. And also we have a music program at one of our sites where students are creating, engineering their freedom songs, what do they, their freedom songs will look like for them today. So I think that freedom songs, um, in the context that you're talking about, um, is still practical for today because I think, I think that like freedom songs is a way, a, a different way for, pe for people to, to express what they were feeling and also that joy that you was talking about, bring that, have that joy coming together. So I, I do, I, I think it's, it's still a practical thing. Okay, thanks. So another question. As education equity is seen as a multifaceted problem, what, in your opinion, this may be from you, Torsha, um, your opinion is the most important part that needs to be recognized and dismantled sooner rather than later in order to address educational gaps in the South? What are the components that, you know, you were talking about the kind of the hydra headed monster of what, what makes up education equity? What is it that? perhaps should be kind of dismantled sooner rather than later to address those things. Money, money. Follow the money. Yes, I would, I would, I would agree with you. Money then, just work on the risk thing. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I would also, uh, look at, looking at it from a policy standpoint when it comes to education equity, uh, and just looking, tracking at some of the legislation is, uh, this session uh, at the state capitol, uh, if, if you, if, if you look, if, if look at the uh, current, one of the bills that you're trying to pass for education funding uh, is the Inspire bill, which will increase funding uh, for uh, for, some, for certain uh, counties and school districts that have had issues with funding. Uh, and, and, and and you look at that as a plus, but then, but then you, also, you also look at the, the issues of uh, education, education as it relates to policy over over the past, I'll say, 20 or 30 years, and you can see uh, how we got to this point where there are, are a thousand plus teacher vacancies, um, schools are shutting down, uh, the the curriculum looks different, and and and, and I, I just have to look back at, at policy, you know, even policy that impacted me growing up. Not, I didn't have an idea, you know, I was, I was underfunded. Uh, or I didn't have the necessary resources, but I, I was just you know going going through school. Like I had parents that you know educated me as well. But when you look at uh, at certain policies over the years, on the federal level and also on the state level, and you look at you know where the where the funding has been, then you look at it. You you, you see where we at where we're at now, and and and, and, you, and you know why. Uh, just no, follow, follow the money. Yeah, you follow the money. You follow the policy. Um, no child left behind. Uh, you look at the current MAEP 
uh, funding formula that has been in place in Mississippi for the past couple of years. Which is very difficult to understand. Yeah, so, 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 <laughs> so, so we're talking about twice. twice. <laughs> yeah, so we're talking about a funding policy and a formula that that with that people don't even understand. People in legislation, they, they don't even understand. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to correct that now with this inspired bill so it can be so people can understand it. Uh, so so you look at the years of policy that people can't understand and, and you see the while we're at, at a such a pivotal point where education equity is an issue in Mississippi and, and just all around uh, the country, especially in the South. Yeah, I mean, it's really not policy. It's it's actually kind of throwing the butt of the smoke screen. Thank you. It's, it's uh, policy. Policy is smoke screen. Now I have two questions here to kind of wrap things up here. Well, I can I say one thing? Yes. About education. Uh, what you, one problem you talk about this wonderful stuff, but we have this great inspired deal. But it comes back just like you said about money. If you're talking about cutting taxes, which doesn't benefit most people, or eliminating the income tax entirely. Right. So you're going to eliminate taxes or cut taxes. Well, something's got to come from somewhere. Who's going to pay? Yep. How are they going to pay? And so, you know, they, they say things that sound good. You didn't fund the other one. What who's, What makes you think you're going to fund this one? And you finally got your teachers up to not where they should be, but not as far back as they were. But, you know, a starting teacher cannot make it in Mississippi. So. Now, and these two questions are really, I think, kind of related, but I'm going to see if I can combine them. You know, the first is, is how much hope do you have that future generations will confront and defeat the issues you all work on? And the other is, kind of, can you imagine events in the future that have the ambition and success of the Mississippi Freedom Project? Um, I guess really kind of, and so I think these are really, these are both kind of looking toward the future, and it's maybe a good place for us to stop it. Kind of, what is it? Kind of looking at Freedom Summer. What is it that you would want to see? Kind of go from Freedom Summer out into the future for, um, and for people in this room who are who are young, who are thinking about uh, work and activism. What is it? You know, what kind of future should they be thinking about? It's a question. But it's like, can you can you imagine a future where these events kind of continue to inspire and keep going into the end, well beyond us? Well, the choice. Yeah, I would say that we must imagine that future. I don't think we have a. I don't think that we should choose not to imagine that future because without imagination, I feel like without the imagination is where the hope starts to die. And the first question was, do I have? Do we have hope? that young people will be moving or like how much hope do you have that future generations will confront and defeat a issue yes yeah, so i have a lot of hope i think that young people are speaking out i think that they are organizing in their own ways and trying to figure out what are the best solutions um but i think that young people are aware of what's happening around them even even if they cannot fully communicate what is happening around them we see their frustration we, we see um and not only do we see their frustration at our sites we hear their frustrations when they're coming to us and they're saying i feel like this isn't okay but I don't know what to do with, I don't know exactly how to go about finding the solutions for what can I do or what can we do. So that means that young people are saying that they are also not okay with the with the way our society is set up currently. So, and I think that young people, um, I don't think that I would see see the advancement in my lifetime, but I do want to like lay the groundwork um, as people for me have laid the groundwork um, so that young people can come after um, all of us who are, who, who are organizing and can, can continue to do the same thing. So I think it's like layers and, and we're building up to that imagined world that we want to see. Well, I, I want to thank you all. I also want to mention that there is a uh, benefit for the Freedom Project at 1225 Beanland. You are all invited. Uh, so please do come and, and support the Freedom Project and maybe move Latosha to a little bit more. But I w really want to thank our panelists this evening for a very 
stimulating conversation. I, I hope my questions were straightforward enough and not confusing, but I, but I want to thank you all for, for your work, and please give our, our panelists a big round of applause.